All right, uh, we'll kick this off then. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Today we're going to be uh, doing having a conversation really around um, the future of healthcare analytics. And um, you know, my name is Steve Hughes. I've been with Paramedic Works for a little while here, and I'm an architect with them. And I've been working with healthcare organizations, financial organizations, utility companies, and so on over the past 15 to 20 years in the area of analytics. And what I really want to call out today is kind of look at what we're seeing happen in healthcare, and then where we see um, some of the tools from Microsoft and other platforms that would be able to help you uh, deal with the diversity of healthcare requirements that are coming in from the merger acquisition side all the way into regulations and who can help you deliver on analytics that you need to deliver on a, on a regular basis. So let's jump right in. I'll have a contact slide for you at the end for me, but we're just going to jump into the content right now and then uh, we'll field some questions at the end if you have some for us. So looking at the healthcare industry today, uh, there's the overall impact in the industry. There's a number of things that, that are impacting us right now. And as we work with customers in this area, we, we're constantly helping them understand how to get the most out of their data. But there's things that are causing complexities in healthcare today that uh, some have been around for a while, but at the same time, um, the, you know, it's one of those things where there's more things to do. Hey, I just saw an audience question on the poll. We did have an all above option, but there just weren't enough spots. I think that's what Liz just pointed out. And because I think that when we look at the impact, and that was what the survey was about, things that are impacting you and in the industry today, and how you know an architecture and how BI can help and analytics can help move you forward today. So we look at what's going on, acquisition and mergers. These are one of those things that happen regularly in any industry, um, but they seem to be happening more and more inside of healthcare. Some of that's in response to the Affordable Care Act, uh, the ability to better manage um, the, the impact of those regulations that have happened. Uh, partnerships are emerging, partnerships that didn't exist before. Uh, you're actually looking at partnerships between insurance companies and healthcare organizations and uh, hospitals. And you, you'll just see just, you know, there's partnerships. And so you can see all this business movement happening. Well, as a result of the business movement that is happening, Data now is coming from all different types of places, and we'll talk about some of those things. It causes problems in getting a clean picture of what you're seeing. Regulations, HIPAA, of course, is out there. Um, PCI, you know, PI, handling PI data, personal identifiable information, is a significant problem as well as handling medical information. The regulations that are surrounding that, the additional impact of relation of regulations and reporting caused by the Affordable Care Act. These are things that are happening in the industry today and are actually a, um, a serious impact to what you want to do from an analytics standpoint. But even more compelling sometimes is the inability to, uh, you know, what do we do about sentiment analysis? Surveys are being issued out. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, other social mediums that are actually out there to allow for sentiment analysis. How is this hospital doing? How well is uh, this healthcare organization rated, how well is you know this hospital rated, how well is this uh, clinic rated, doctors and so on, and you just keep going through the whole healthcare uh, position, especially as more tech savvy users come into play and consumers of healthcare become, they're going to start looking, they're going to be paying attention to if, you know, if they're seeing bad reports on what's happening within an industry or within a, at a hospital, they're going to be concerned. Do they want to take their family there? Do they change their health care? So these things you want to manage and understand what's going on out there. But also just understanding things like demographics from census data, weather information, external data. These are all things that are out there that can impact the industry in ways that they used not, they used not be an issue before. Or maybe I guess really, maybe it's not so much of an issue, but now that you've been brought to the forefront. Each of these impacts causes a series of challenges. Disparate data sources. It is very common right now for Paramedic Works to work with medical organizations as we try to help interview everybody from a hospital to health court and healthcare organizations on a larger scale to understand how to take data from multiple EHR and EMR solutions and get a complete picture of the healthcare for a patient or for a system or for a hospital just to align everything and bring it together. Some 
scenarios are not just about you know the end analysis. Some of it's just having the patient information collected and available in a single point so a doctor can get a holistic picture of what's going on. Some of that is required by HIPAA, some of that is required by Affordable Care Act. Um, some of it's just required because four hospitals chose to merge and they were all using different EMR systems and they're trying to understand, okay, how do we get a complete picture until we can either go to one or do we go to one? Or do we leave them running on their existing system to figure out how to merge the data after the fact? Those are challenges and questions that have to be asked and handled. Misaligned analytic solutions. So you, you have a great solution out there and it has an awesome analytic and you know tool on it and it's so cool it works great for that EMR and it was great five years ago so how do we deal with that and you know what do we do do can we use that can we not use that integration of public data sets we talked a little about this weather disease population data this data exists um, healthcare.gov we'll look at that in one of our demos um, medicare.gov there, there's sites out there with information that can help you as an organization or help your organization actually understand better the you know the type of patients you have coming in if there's things you need to plan for and accommodate moving forward. Finally, the speed of IT innovation. Uh, granted, these aren't the only challenges. There's four that I'm calling out today, but this is one of the big ones. Um, it is not easy to upgrade your EMR solution. It just isn't. Um, and as the companies that produce them continue to have uh, more improvements in that area and they provide more information. It's amazing to watch as they go through this process, and, and it's like anything else. I mean, in our industry, we deal a lot with just on the database server side. You think about, you know, hey, we're going to get um, SQL Server needs to upgrade. It's upgrading every two years. I'm sure that, you know, EMR solutions are upgrading at a similar pace. How is it that um, at that pace can you keep up? Your goal as a healthcare organization is to provide the best health care to your patients, not necessarily to continue to upgrade your systems and your solutions. Now, they go hand in hand, but better health care and upgrading a solution, you may have to weigh out these possibilities and decide what's best in your environment. So let's talk about responding to these challenges. The next few minutes, I'm going to talk about these four items. And Part of what we're talking about is the future of analytics and healthcare. So we're going to talk about how these items play into and impact the future of healthcare. Consumption-based architecture is an architecture that I talk about, which it is very, um, which we'll get into, but is very helpful in understanding how we can take advantage of disparate systems and plan for it as opposed to not. Cell service analytics. How can we push the analytics into the hands of the users more frequently? Um, of course, there's security concerns and those kind of things around that as well. But um, we need to still be able to push cell service down to our uh, to the doctors or to the administrators who need to see this information and work with it readily. It may have a question to ask. It only needs to be answered one time. They don't need a report for it. Cloud enhanced analytics. Um, not taking advantage of the cloud is a mistake. So how can you in healthcare take advantage of the cloud? What's out there? What's available to you? What does that look like uh, in a way to improve analytics in the healthcare space? And finally, data lifecycle optimization. I want to talk a little about something that Pragmatic Works uh, tries to help organizations with on a regular basis and how that would fit into healthcare as well. So let's jump right in. Consumption-based architecture. This is an overview of an architecture, uh, and there is a presentation. You can reach out to Pragmatic Works, and we have I have a full session on consumption-based architecture I did a couple months ago. But I want to talk about it here in light of what we're you know in the in light of the difficulties and challenges we have. The first thing I want to talk about is the fact that we have data everywhere. And the consumption-based architecture, the overall concept is this area called consumable data. If the data can be consumed, meaning it's in a, you know, it's in a way that we can actually talk about and use and people can use analytic tools against it, discovery tools and visualization tools against it, what are some examples of those? So if source data, if, you know, in some cases, the EMR source solution, people have been reporting against it. They understand it. They actually understand the schema. It should scare all of us that some business analysts will understand the schema. Um, but what if we were to give them this replica in the consumable data space and say, hey, you know what? You can go against this reporting. And then, you know, sometimes we have to load data depending on if it's, um, you know, 
not something that's easily understood or consumed, but it also doesn't need to be transformed. I think this is where the differentiator comes in between consumption-based architecture and an enterprise data warehouse or a um, big data solution. This architecture assumes that it, you know an enterprise data warehouse, if it exists, has value in your solution. It's just not complete. So how can you take advantage of potentially two or three enterprise data warehouses if you've been involved in a merger or an acquisition scenario? Do we need to actually merge those data warehouses or do we need to make them available and talk about how they relate to each other and how we can bring the data together? And this is where things like master and dimension data come in. A golden record for your patient could ha should have a key to every solution we're talking about here. Whether if I'm going to take a patient data and I want to actually build a report on it, I want to pull data from my two enterprise data warehouses, my EHR and from my... Um, Let's see, what else? We, uh, for my financial system, I've got four different solutions there. One, which is, a, you know, my, my EHR is going to be a replica data set. I have two enterprise data warehouses from the hospital we just bought and the hospital we had in place already. And I now have a financial solution I need to talk about. Well, what's great about this scenario is that we make the assumption that moving all that data together to create a single enterprise data warehouse is a large scale, huge project. How can we help you as a group understand how to organize your data in a consumable fashion so that people can understand it? Master Dimension Data help with that. There are tools out there from uh, master data ma management tools to simply building out the dimensional side of a dimension model allows you to actually create a scenario where I can use a master customer record or a master date record or master location record use those and put all the natural keys in there, for instance, and I can now actually have a scenario where a mashup tool such as ClickView or Power BI can draw the relationship between the different systems and pull the data together for a quicker analysis. Now, that doesn't displace any solution that's out there today. We're not talking that you would get rid of an enterprise data warehouse. You may have a, a real need. What it says is that I can get to an answer faster than it will require me to create a consolidated enterprise data warehouse. That type of effort is huge in this scenario because it allows you to look at your data and take advantage of these systems and use them immediately out of the gate if you plan for it and you plan to work through the scenario. Because what does this bring in the bear? This analytic tools and discovery tools can work on top of this consumable data model. For instance, an analytic tool such as analysis services can consume data from multiple sources. Now, analysis services multidimensional is going to sit best on a star schema. So, in order to best do that, you may end up building out a star schema. It doesn't. Uh, you notice there's no technologies, you know, or vendor specific items. If that data warehouse is in Oracle or it's in SQL Server, don't care. Uh, Postgres SQL, maybe that's a, your choice of tool. We can use those. But as we move up that chain and we look at something like Power Pivot or Tabular Models and Analysis Services, Power Pivot in the Power BI space or even Quick View, these type of tools can now consume a variety of data types. So maybe in this scenario we have um, a large amount of um, document-driven databases. So maybe you're using CouchDB or Mon MongoDB or something like that, and you're consuming a different type of data. The key is, can the tools that we're talking about reach into the consumable data space and use them? Tools like Power Pivot can. It, it can re look at a whole bunch of data types and, or data types, it can look at a whole bunch of data source types and say, okay, I don't care if this came from, you know, Oracle, if one of you in margin Oracle, one's on SQL Server, and my master data is sitting in a um, in Azure Table Services or in a key value pair, it lets me have these relationships. I now draw the links inside of Power Pivot and I can now do analysis across the whole scope of my data very quickly and allow my analysts to move forward and get reporting out that they couldn't get out before without a huge amount of effort putting together highly organized enterprise data warehouse solutions. That's the goal behind the consumption-based architecture. At the end of the day, any tool should be able to, that can reach into that data and look at it, whether it's a reporting tool like Crystal Reports or reporting services or some other tool like Azenda reporting, or some other tool that's out there, you can use those to reach into the consumable data. Now, not all visualization tools can consume all types of data. That's where discovery and analytic tools bridge the gap between visualization when it's necessary. 
but if it's already and available, you have the opportunity to actually bring this data to bear and let people begin to use and consume it right away. That's what it, you know, this is not like it's really anything new, it's really encapsulating what is out there and saying how do we make this now available to tools that can actually consume it whereas they used to not be able to. So that's the first step in answering this equation. It's talking, you know, setting up your architecture, understanding the data access, uh, data intelligence section that you see on the on the left side of the screen. That's all about documenting these systems and how to get into them and what is necessary. Um, so if you start doing these type of scenarios, you're going to see that you can move the data and you can not move the data. But basically, the idea is that whatever is in that space is data that you have a way to go out and consume and use for reporting and other needs. So next, so we were talking about discovery tools. So now let's talk about self service analytics. It's a natural progression. Now I'm going to talk about this in context of the Microsoft tool set. And there's a reason for that. I, I'm going to talk about HIPAA and regulations and compliance at the end of this and why it's important to pick and choose your tools appropriately. So in this case, we're looking at self service analytics, Power BI. Why does this matter? The key to really being able to move forward on analytics without falling into place where you need to use tools to build out enterprise data warehouses are those first two tools in this list, Power Pivot and Power Query. Those two allow you to analyze a variety of solutions and pull in data from a variety of locations and do this work, put it together in a meaningful way. Now, that you know, Power Pivot can scale at a smaller level. It's designed to pull in small amounts of data, which is great for prototyping. Microsoft has a natural progression of the tabular model when you make this enterprise ready and consume large amounts of data. The truth of the matter is not everything be met by self-service analytics. So you might actually have to put an analytics structure in place to help further this process. The point is you're going to be doing things from the perspective of the people who need to consume the data will drive what needs to be into the data warehouse. If something doesn't fit um, and needs to be consumed in a different way, you will know that because they said, hey, we went in, we tried this, it doesn't work, here's what we need to make it work, and now you're intelligently building out additional, more complex components in your consumable portion, consumable data architecture in order to meet a very specific need. And that is very different from the build it for everyone and they will come. Enterprise data warehouse solutions, and typically we go out, we ask lots of questions, we do a whole lot of effort and work to find out what people need. We find out what they need, we build a tool, we might take three months, we might take two years to build an enterprise data warehouse solution. We're feeling really good, we get delivered and HIPAA requirements changed three months ago, which now requires substantial rewrite of a good portion of what we're doing. Self-service analytics helps us bypass or at least move quickly so we can move and respond to the scenarios that matter. Because at the end of the day, what we're after in this solution with self-service analytics is, it, is not necessarily so that Joe, the you know Dr. Joseph, can go out and do whatever he needs to do just on his little world. Sometimes self-service is really about departmental self-service in that the finance department can get what they need, the, the regulations department, the people who are providing all the reporting back for the Affordable Care Act or for HIPAA or any other type of requirement. They have the capability to do this without requiring extensive IT projects in order to get it done. So that's where the self-service analytics play comes in. And we want to really, um, you know, Microsoft and everyone else, you know, Tableau and ClickView and uh, there's so many tools out there saying, well, we want to get the power to your users. The reality is the power needs to go to the right place. So even though self-service analytics is a great buzzword, be sure to understand what self-service analytic means to your company. You might be self-serving an analyst that serves a thousand people with the end product, but the key is is that that the people who are that team or that person who's doing that reporting needs less from IT to be successful than they did before. So IT can focus on making data available for consumption, as opposed to building out massive solutions to be consumed. And I think that's where we start to draw this line and, and how you can be successful in analytics in healthcare given the rate of change we're talking about. The other tools on the list here, um, Excel includes some of the RBI components, deploys Office 365 and SharePoint. Believe it or not, Excel is still one of the most powerful BI tools in the world. 
It's also one of the most readily available. Uh, we currently have a number of solutions where we are deploying Excel-based dashboards in Office 365 and SharePoint. Why? Users are able to create them. When we talk about self-service, that's what we're doing. We're handing off the power to the people that are servicing the needs of their group, their department, of the enterprise. And by giving them that capability and a tool they're readily familiar with, with a back end of consumable data that they're able to easily consume and put in these products, they're able to deploy uh, very compelling dashboards and just using Excel, not necessarily even using the Power BI components like Power View and so on. What's coming up? Microsoft is working through PowerBI.com and Power BI Designer. They're both in preview. This is kind of the merging of both of those worlds into a place where they can continue to add value in the Power BI arena. And we'll look at some of this here, but basically it contains all the Power Suite. So if you think of what's in Power, Power BI today, you have Power Pivot, which is a mashup tool, Power Query, which is a data extraction and transformation tool for Excel, and Power, Power BI. Then you also have uh, Power View, which is a visualization tool that's used. It can do some very compelling visualizations. Um, and then, let's see, that's three of the four. You got Power Q&A, which is ability to ask questions and answer of your data. And then Power Map, which is uh, produces, at this point, produces kind of a video presentation of how data looks like over time. So we're going to look at a couple of these products. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of Power BI, because while you like probably hearing me talk passionately about you know, how you do it, I want to show you some of the tools and some of the power that's in these tools. And I will say Power and Power BI, because Power BI is powerful. I'll say it a lot, and I'm sorry. It's not intentional. It's a product name for Microsoft that I can't help. So let's have a look at a few of these tools. Let me go ahead and switch out here. I want to start with an Excel spreadsheet. So I have one working here, but I want to show you what it would look like. So I'm going to go into Excel 2013, and I'm going to open a new spreadsheet, and we're going to have some fun here. So Power Query is an add-in for 2013 right now, and you can get it, and it'll open up a tab for you up here. Power Pivot, you can turn on in the background. So both these tools are readily available right in here. So let's talk about Power Query first. So when we look at Power Query, I mentioned that you know if you want to pull healthcare data, so let's let's do that. Let's go healthcare. Oh look at that! I'm already was looking at stuff. So let's healthdata.gov domain external. Okay, so I've just searched for healthcare data to see what's available publicly and already positioned. So if we look at this, we can actually look at something like hospital value-based purchasing, heart failure scores. Lists out the provider numbers. If, By the way, if you're one of these providers, you might be interested to know what's being published about you. Um, managed care plan utilization. You know, What are we looking at? So you can look at the data. It tells us, so this is from the New York State Department of Health. So if you're in New York, what are the, how do they use health services? So um, I'm, I'm about, let's pull this data set. So we're going to go ahead and go this one here. We're going to go and edit this query. And this is what's called Power Query. So what's going to happen is this is going to pull up the data set for us. And we're going to decide what data we want, and we're going to throw it into Excel for use. So the reason I want to show this demo to you, because I want you to be aware that I I have not seen this data set before, so I'm interested in some things like, all right, so I have um, child care. You know, let's only look at, let's see how many years they have. They only have 2009, so this is only 2009 data, so that's good to know. Who the payer was and the plan name. So if we're looking at plan names, let's have a look at plan names. Let's filter out, um, let's filter them all out except for, let's take Metro Plus Health Plan. Sure, why not? I have no idea who this is, so if it's your company, I'm sorry, I'm targeting you. Now we can look at uh, the different measures. So we got emergency room visits, and it's already categorized for us. So we go here, hey, look at the categories are here. They give us ages, um, both genders, and it goes into a bunch of percentage marks. Now, I didn't look at this to um, confirm what the, all the measurement has been, but it gives us kind of an idea. And, uh, and, you know, if we really want to focus on an age category, which might make sense, so we may say, you know what, we're really focused today on ages 0 to 12. And see what they fall in. And this goes into some of the measures that were being done. We have the gender has now filtered out, so we can look at guys. Let's just make this for males. And what you'll notice 
is at the moment it's filtering my rows. So now I have this data set that I want to include in. I go, okay, this query is where I want it to be. So I'm going to close and load it, and I'm going to load it to, I can load it to one of two places. I can load it as a table um, in my new worksheet. So let's go ahead and do that, and we're going to add it to a data model behind the scenes. I'll show you what happens there. So now I have this data here. Now I also loaded this to the data uh, to um, the data model. Well, the data model is in Power Pivot. So if I go to Power Pivot now and do, I'll go to Manage and Power Pivot. I will see this data table also lives here. Unless it makes a liar out of me. Hold on. Let's double check. This is why I have one working already in case something like this happens. Query doesn't look like it's going to work for me. Let's go back. Oh, there it goes. Just took a little time. All right. So this is the data loaded in the data model. So I can actually go in here and I want to do something simple like I need the count of, let's do count of pairs. Actually, let's do the count. This is, we're just going to do a quick count to say, hey, how many, how many people are in this list? Now we can see there's 28, but I want to be able to add this as a measure. So give me the count, please. Boom. Okay, so this is my count of pairs. Let's go ahead and expand this. You can see that it gives me a value here. I can now use this and it'll slice by all these metrics here as well. I can also go in here and give me the distinct count, which will tell me the number of pairs that were actually done. So I got two pairs that are being used the whole time. At this point, I'm already starting to put together some metrics I can use for analysis. I go out here. The other thing I can do is remember how I talked about master data and the importance of master data. What you need to be aware of is that this is just one table inside of Excel. If I had the plan ID information or um, some other information around the payer that I wanted to bring in, I can go out and pull that data in. Let's go ahead and pull from other sources so you can see the full list. This is the places I can bring data in from. So we got all the SQL databases that are there, um, you know, analysis services. You can pull from a reporting services report. Don't know that I recommend that necessarily. Um, and you can pull from the Azure Marketplace to find, you know, if I'm looking at this, I want to compare it to something from the Marketplace, which includes some demographics or some other data, I can do that. Um, OData fees, Excel, and text, and so on. Well, well, that's, you know, that's one of those things we can do. I can bring that data in, and then I can go back into the diagram view. And I'm going to show you a finished one of these. I can actually draw relationships between data that came from multiple sources. So enough of me talking about this. Let's close this. And minimize there. So this is a one that I did that was fairly straightforward. Let's look at our data sources first. So if we go to Power Query. Um, and let's look at the workbook queries I used. So in this case, I'm using three workbook queries. One's the high, the hospital value of price pricing. The breakdown by state. This data comes from uh, Wikipedia, and then I believe, yeah, this one's from Wikipedia as well. Um, so you can actually see there are actually different sources. If I had this data in a database, I could do the same thing. By loading all of these into my Power Pivot model in the background, um, I was able to relate this data from three different locations in this way. So what I've got here is I'm taking the hospital value and I'm looking at state-based analysis. So over here they actually have the state as an, as an abbreviation, so I drew a relationship between this abbreviation for this table. This is kind of my join table, lets me actually relate this data over to here, which is a breakdown by state. Um, I think this is, yeah, this is race identification. Um, yeah, so this is the basic population and race stuff. Here, so over here though, this is actually listing it by the state name. So now I've got them related to, through this table, I can relate to both pieces. Here's where that becomes relevant. Now, if I want you to think through now, if I had this coming off of two EHR solutions, I might have the customer sitting in the middle here. And I might have their IDs and two different IDs and related to them. And now I've related data that was before very hard to relate. So now we go back. Um, let's go ahead and close. Close the power pivot. So now when I look at this, this is my pivot table. I'm going to close my queries. And my pivot table, based on power pivot, here's the fields. I get all the fields that I had available before, just like a normal pivot table. And what I've done in this case is I just pulled the count providers and the average population. What's really relevant where this comes into place is I pulled the state name out of the middle table. And now I can actually say, okay, let's look at this for the state of Alaska. 
So there's eight providers. The population, even though it says average of population, it's an average across all the states. So in this case, it's uh, only one. So 731,000 is the population. There's eight provider numbers that are included in that scenario. Do Arizona, you get a higher number. We can add in any number of slicers. Um, so we can actually go in here and we say, hey, you know what, let's go ahead and add the county name of slicers. So once I'm in Arizona, I can actually go ahead and pick different counties. You'll notice that some of the data goes away because it doesn't have county information. Uh, so let's filter this out. So uh, you know, I'm starting to pull in different types. So I have all these options I can do between this data that makes this very easy to work with, and I can relate data that was not there before. Now this is just kind of that, and you know, an analysts like this kind of thing. So they're going to be like, hey, this is cool. Um, I can analyze this data. I can do some stuff with it. I can bring the relationships across, like you're showing. That's great. But what does the end product start to look like? Well, for that. Let's go out to PowerBI.com. I think I closed my window down on that one. Uh, let's see here. We'll get that come bring that back up here. Sorry about that. Must have closed too many windows. So this is PowerBI.com. This is in preview. A lot of the capability, though, is available in um, in Excel and a combination of Excel and a combination of Power BI and a Power BI and Office 365. This is a bringing together of all those components. So as we look at the healthcare dashboard here, let's go ahead and I'm going to zoom this up a little bit more so we can start to see this. So um, I'll close this guy. All right, so this is basically the demo dashboard. So you can see here that if you put all this effort in, pulling data together from a variety of sources, you can look at things like sentiment, and I basically get a high-level dashboard here that just shows me a few of these pieces around the Medicare of this imaginary hospital scenario. Um, but it is pulling actual Medicare data. So I can look down here, count of hospitals by hospital type. What's really important here is that the interaction between the systems I can actually come over here and say I want to see the count of hospitals by type. So I can see, um, I can get, dig into this a little bit closer so I can now see that I have acute hospitals. I'll explore more, look at more about those hospitals. It can bring me to something similar to what we saw in Excel. And I have the ability to go and pull in more about those hospitals. Let's go back. The important part here is to understand that as we build these pieces out, we have the ability to um, drill into a variety of reports that end up behind the supporting this data. So this is a behind that analysis sediment piece. Um, I can now do further drill down from the dashboard. I can look at um, Alabama. We were doing that before. Or, which I believe we're looking at Alaska. I don't see them on the list. So let's just go with Alabama or Arizona. That's Arkansas. Yeah. So we go to Arizona. We say, hey, look at all this information. Because the level, you know, we're now looking at a report, there's a high level of interaction between these. So I can actually go down and say, um, let's just look at acute hospitals. And it's going to work to filter all the rest of these for acute hospitals. And you'll see that the filters change for all these. So this is one of those things where there's a lot of interaction inside the Microsoft product. It allows you to cross-reference a lot of data and use a lot of this stuff in Power BI. So this is just kind of that, that first level, that highlight of Power BI. And, and what's available to you. You can, um, So hopefully you get a flavor for this. We have a lot of other training on this, so you can dig into more what you can do with Power BI, or we'd be glad to talk with you about it. But the important part here is that understanding that this is part of the self-service model, and that anybody can create this if they have access to the data, and they're going to be able to deliver it out into the field and be able to have people using it and consuming that data on a regular basis. Keep in mind, this one's a preview. This should be released. I believe it's getting released this year at some point. Um, but you can do this on a lot of the same work in Excel, and Power BI exists in SharePoint or Office 365 today. All right, let's get back into here. So that gave you kind of just a quick rundown. I mean, it was really high level. Um, look at Power BI. I just wanted you to see some of this stuff in action and see what's there. So let's move on to Cloud Enhanced Analytics and talk about that for a minute. I'm calling out two specific 
uh, tools from Microsoft in this scenario. There are other um, tools out there available. These are two. These is we're talking cloud enhanced. So when you start to look at what you're going to do to to um, do more work in your analytics space, there are a lot of tools out there um, that you may have in place. You may have SaaS solutions. You may have um, Hadoop distributions from Cloudera or things like that. So these are this is the difference that I'm talking about here. These are all cloud enhanced. This is the ability to take advantage of some of these uh, very powerful techniques to do deeper analysis of the data you have without a large investment in cost related to that. So if we look at the first one, HD Insight. Um, what I like about HD Insight is that it allows you to actually stand up essentially a Hadoop cluster of whatever power you need for as long as you need it and collapse it. There is no capital expenditure, meaning you are not going to go out and buy um, 100 servers to support a Hadoop cluster in a scenario. You you know, basically plug it through to HD Insight so you can do analysis. So if you think of it this way, if you're not familiar with what, it, what where the power of Hadoop lies, it has a lot to do with the distributed processing power. Um, so what you have the capability of doing is putting a large amount of data and, and distributing the cost of processing queries against it in, in across every server. So unlike a scale-up scenario where in a SQL server or an Oracle solution, we might continue to, to make it, give it more processors, um, speed up it, give it more RAM and all this type of thing. This here goes the opposite. It's a scale out type of architecture, which basically the point of it is, is I can go and take a hard query and run it against smaller chunks and bring all that data back together for results. So cloud enhanced analytics, this is part of that. Uh, Azure DW is not on my list, but it was also, um, it's being worked on right now, it has additional capabilities and power within this solution for some type of you know, some similar type of heavy lifting when it comes to this type of work. Uh, so you, you know, you got the advantage of it's out there, it's in the cloud. It's yeah, the best part of cloud is really is just when I need it. When I need this, I can go out and put it together and have it up and running, and I'm gonna pay for it while I use it, and I'm gonna shut it down, and it's going to be very cost effective for me to do. Azure Machine Learning, very similar. This allows you to do data science analysis. Um, a lot of, it, has, it contains a lot of the models that you need from the beginning. And if you're doing some analysis on patient profiling or those kind of things that help you understand um, some of the actuarial, actuarial requirements you might be looking at, depending on what your scenario is, Azure Machine Learning has the capability to do complex data science analysis at a low learning curve. Um, so you can start out right away without a full understanding of the models. And as a matter of fact, some of the recommendations are to go out and try a variety of models. Understand what they mean. Go do some research to figure out what best fits your business case, your business need. Because at the end of the day, what you want to do is to be able to take advantage of this. This, like Azure Insight, these are tools that are available um, when you need them and you're not building out an entire solution in order to put that together. You're basically taking advantage of these platforms that are available for you to use and consume on an as-needed basis. This is not all the possibilities in cloud-based analytics. You may find it necessary to take advantage of um, standing up, a, even standing up a database for quick analysis that you plan to throw away. The hardest thing in the world in IT uh, before cloud, you know, cloud-based tools came along was that if I wanted to prototype something, I'd have to still buy the hardware, I'd have to make that an initial capital investment to make it worthwhile, or I was using outdated equipment, so my prototype might take longer than it should have. In this scenario, you can leverage the power that you need in the cloud to take advantage of the tooling that's available to do work through um, these use cases that actually matter. Now, because we're talking about cloud, uh, we also want to take into account what does that mean for Microsoft and HIPAA? And I bring this up because this comes up very often in a conversation, and I really got tired of looking it up, to be honest. So I put it on the slide deck so I can you know, get it to everyone. But what you need to be aware of is that Microsoft takes compliance and regulations very, very seriously. Um, the quote above is from their, you know, from their site, the, their compliance site on Azure. Because of that scenario, and I also I have two links on the slide. The slide deck will be available to you. Um, the second one talks about Office 365. 
So both these are the these are the this is the core of Microsoft's cloud and hosted solutions. Azure covers the bulk of the back end type scenarios or some of the complex tooling like um, HD Insight and um, machine learning as well as their databases and all the other stuff they host online. What I caution you on, and I encourage you, if you plan to use the cloud, whether it's Microsoft Cloud or any other cloud out there, you need to make sure you understand what the HIPAA and PCI compliance are for the components you plan to use. This is very, very important because if you're going to put data out there um, and it contains identifiable information, then you need to understand where Microsoft is protecting you and where they are not. Not everything in the Microsoft tool stack is currently HIPAA compliant. So, but that being said, Microsoft continues to add more and more of their tool set into HIPAA compliance. And because you know we're talking about healthcare and future, future analytics, the tooling online will by far outpace anything we can do in-house because of the level of change that they can t bring to bear uh, in a cloud scenario. So in order to take advantage of that tooling, it's very important to keep up with what Microsoft has available, what they're, what they're compliant with. And in some cases, if you can use non-compliant data for analysis, you probably have more, you can use everything. Um, but be completely aware of what's out there and what you need. Microsoft publishes on a regular basis. They brag about what they're compliant with. And it's very important to take advantage of that knowledge. And that way you can take advantage of the tool set in a, in a good way. All right, finally, um, last thing I want to talk about is data lifecycle optimization. Data lifecycle optimization is, in, is from Primatic Works. It's a methodology, a way of looking at where you are in the life of your data. And, you know, I, this is going to be, I warn you now, partial sales pitch, partially just really wanted you to have a look at this and to begin to understand that your data lives in a variety of different places. Consumption-based architecture and this play hand in hand. Where is your data? So if you look at on the left side, I mean, you know, there's all these architecture, availability, continuity, and performance observation. Those are hard course solutions, things that we can bring to bear, help you. Today we've been talking about enterprise BI, big data architecture, and predictive analytics. That side, the right side of the rainbow, I guess you could call it, what we're looking at from this point is where are you today? If you feel that, you know, are you being able to effectively deliver enterprise BI? Do you have everything you need in place to do so? Where are the gaps? Are you looking to take advantage of big data but not sure how? What are your, what are your gaps are? What are you looking, what tooling makes sense? Did HD Insight interest you because you're looking at this, you know, a volume of data, you're trying to figure out how to analyze it to get more out of it? Those are things that you need to take into account when you look at your data lifecycle. What are the pieces that matter? Do you want to take advantage of machine learning? Can you take advantage of machine learning with the data you currently have, or do you need to do some other things before then? The left side says, are you in a secure, safe place? Basically, is your system, can they keep your lights on from a business standpoint? That's really the question on the left side. If you're not able to keep the lights on, not able to do the work you need to do, that's a different question different topic area at a different time, but what we really want to focus on is where are you today and what can we do to help? Do you want us to help? Do you want to look at this? There, uh, my next slide has a link to this um, where you can do get an assessment done. What I, regardless of whether you choose to work with us or not, I really encourage you to, to closely look at your, the lifecycle optimization. We have a white paper on it. It's really important that you understand where you are today and where you want to be and what kind of steps you want to take to get there. Obviously, we'd love to help you, but when it comes to the future analytics, you can't take advantage of some of the more complex scenarios without a good understanding of where you are today and what you can do with that. Okay, that's my advertising for the day. Well, I guess I got more advertising. So that concludes what I had uh, for today's presentation. Hopefully, you heard my passion about you know, self-service, about consumption-based architecture, about leveraging the cloud, and we're, and then looking at holistically from a data lifecycle assessment. But really what you need to be aware of is in today's future of analytics and for healthcare, 
don't be scared of the fact you have disparate data sets. Don't, you know, embrace disparity, embrace these things and figure out how to leverage them and take advantage of what you have available to meet the needs of your customers and so on moving forward. I wasn't paying attention to questions there for late. Uh, do we have any questions or any comments um, that I can help with? I do yeah. want to point out the Contact Permetic Works, that's our website. Um, the Success Permetic Works Stages of Data Lifecycle Optimization will take you to the assessment. You can actually search our site for the white paper. I'm doing, you know, helping Liz out here a little bit. And my <laughs> contact information is on the lower left there. I am known as Data on Wheels. Kind of funny, the guy called Data on Wheels is talking about healthcare. But I have done a lot of, I started out in planning on, or actually working in transportation analytics and then moved on to a lot of other different areas of analytics. So feel free to reach out to me, check my blog post. I talk a lot about Excel and using it in BI. There you go. You got the whole ramp up for me on what I see in the future. Great. Okay, we do have a couple questions, so I'll go ahead and start reading those off. Um, if you build your Excel with Power Query and Power Pivot, can you export your model into the uh, into your corporation tabular model? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's very that is a natural regression. So we're you know if we talk about where Power Pivot plays, Power Pivot can be personal, deployed to SharePoint is departmental, meaning it can meet a, a certain size of needs and security. But a fuller security, a fuller model, a tabular model, you basically open up Visual Studio and pull in your Power Pivot model, you now have a tabular model, you can deploy it. The only issue today is Power Query is not a data source for, um, for tabular models, so be aware of that. If you're doing a complex Power Query model, there are some other options we can help you out with those. I don't have the time to go into details on that one, but just be aware that that is, a, is um, the only drawback at this point. Okay, what is the difference between count of pair and distinct count of pair? Uh, so when we were looking at that, count of pair actually just counted the, <laughs> okay, so I did count, and what it really was is a row count. So count of pair was just row count. So there was 26 pairs there. Distinct count actually did something that's very hard to do if you're familiar with analysis services. It actually counted the distinct names. So when it showed, I believe it showed six distinct names, um, that means there are six different pairs that were unique within that list, uh, as opposed to but just a count of rows, because otherwise it's just a count of rows. So. Okay. Um, I know you already covered this, but maybe you want to reiterate it or cover it a little bit more. People talking about the security of cloud in Azure, you know, with HIPAA and all that kind of stuff. So um, I know yeah. you did go over it. Maybe you just want to reiterate it or add a couple more points on that. I do want to reiterate it. There are a number of organizations who are already have um, done the HIPAA and the BAA compliance. Um, I know of a couple healthcare providers that have actually switched over to Office 365, which I think actually is that one, the HIPAA compliance is rock solid from everything I can see. Um, the Azure one's the one you need to pay attention to because some Azure components are not covered by HIPAA and you need to be aware of that depending on what kind of data you plan to use and, and what, your, what your own internal regulations are at your company. But it is, Microsoft takes it seriously, so they, they back their compliance rules and they keep them up to date with the new rules, new rulings coming out. Yeah, and I think doing, and if you guys do want to kind of more information on this, I think doing that data lifecycle assessment that Steve mentioned is a great way if you kind of want to know where you're at or where you need to be. Um, it's a great way to get a free assessment from us. Yeah, and we can also follow that up, obviously, to help understand where you, you know, where do you want to go from here kind of thing as well. We're more than happy to work with you on that. Um, it's what we do. We do data and <laughs> right. we do data and analytics, so there you go. Yeah. Um, someone wants to know if there are any good references or books for data analytics in healthcare. You know, that's a really good question. Let's follow that one up. Um, could you, you know, whoever asked that question, send that note to Liz on that, she'll forward that to me and I will, or you can just send it direct to me. Um, and I'll see what I can track down. I'm not sure that there is, but uh, I've been surprised before. Generally stuff like that is pretty niche. So. Right. Um, a couple of people are asking if you are going to share your presentation, the slides. Uh, yes, I sent them to you, so. Oh, you did, you sure okay. Them? It's probably yeah, in my so. email and I haven't checked it. <laughs> Liz will make sure that gets shared out in the right way. Um, if not, you can always visit the presentation again. If you need it, you have my email address. I can make sure that happens and you can bug. If I don't get back to you right away, then you bug Liz and she will annoy me until I get back to you. <laughs> so it's part of my, it's in my job description. 
Um, yes. All right, we just got another question come through. Um, if our BI tools are not solely Microsoft and AD based, are there any HIPAA tools that you recommend? No, I, I can't speak to the HIPAA tooling outside of the Microsoft space. We primarily work in that space. I'm sure there's compliance. You'd have to look up the individual tool and check the compliance around those. If it stays, the big problem with HIPAA compliance is if it goes to the cloud. Um, inside your walls, as long as you're securing it properly, you should be able to meet compliance rules with internal audits. But if you go to cloud, then you're dependent on the cloud provider to give you some of that auditing. Um, it's always a risk to use a tool that does not meet the regulation and compliance standards of your industry. So something to always keep aware of. And let's be honest, I mean, I, I don't even know if Microsoft lists like Microsoft Office directly as HIPAA compliant because it's really more about um, the rest of your environment. So you would want to talk to your internal compliance folks about that to see what's needed. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions we have for today. If you guys think of any other questions, again, Steve's contact information is up on the screen. If you somehow forget that contact information, you can always email me, Liz. That's what that's the email that's tied to all of your go-to webinar notifications. Um, and we're more than happy to help you with anything. And we thank you guys for attending the webinar, and we look forward to talking with you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Steve.